Okay, so everyone, thank you for coming to the choral student um, identification lecture. And we will start with Caitlin, who will be giving us a presentation on what we are doing this, which is the stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, we all work for different NGOs and or are volunteers for them. So the organizations that are helping us out is uh, BICA, the Bay Islands Conservation Association, Coral Reef Alliance, and uh, the uh, Utila Coral Restoration Program. So we will have a, um, a small like 20 minute presentation or 20 minutes, half an hour presentation on what this disease is and why we are so worried about it that we called this meeting to just uh, reach as many people as we can on to why we're doing this. And then we will have the first part of the coral identification lecture. Um, so Caitlin, if you want to start the presentation. Okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna give you guys um, a brief introduction to this new coral disease. Um, if during the presentation uh, you can't see something or have a question, please go ahead and turn your microphone on and go ahead and ask. Um, I can't see the, the meeting screen while I'm presenting, so I won't be able to see into the chat. Okay, so here we go. Um, Andrea just introduced you guys to um, these organizations. If you don't know about them yet, you can go to our Facebook page and I've posted links to all of them um, and please give them a like, see what they're all about. Okay, a little history of stony coral tissue loss disease. So this disease was first detected in 2014 on reefs near Miami, Florida. At that time, um, there was a prolonged coral bleaching event and also the dredging of the Miami port. So the corals were already under some stress from that. So that might have something to do with the disease emergence. Um, by now, over half of the Florida reef tract, more than 96,000 acres has been affected. The disease outbreak is still ongoing. If you see the map to the right, um, the disease progression year by year, um, as you can see, it's spreading both north and south and reaching the northern limits of the Florida reef tract, and it's still progressing uh, to the southern limits. Um, in Florida, there's been a large coordinated response by many regional and national partners, including um, governmental organizations and marine protected areas in the Florida Keys um, and many other organizations. So there are teams conducting um, research into the pathogen or pathogens that cause this disease. Um, there have been lab and field treatment trials for different treatments. Coral rescue mission, where they're actually taking uh, healthy corals off the reef and sending those out to aquariums and zoos throughout the country to try to keep the genetic diversity of the corals and hopefully uh, restore them at a later date. There's already some restoration um, initiatives going on and of course, continued surveying and monitoring. So experts from the Florida response are assisting in the wider Caribbean response efforts sharing knowledge, doing workshops, and advising um, other countries and territories on how to respond to this disease. So far, these are the known locations of the um, SCTLD outbreaks. So as you can see, it's spreading quite a bit through the Caribbean, um, close to us in Mexico and in Northern Belize. There have been outbreaks, um, so it is very, very likely that in the near future we will see this on our reefs. So some of the responses to the disease in the affected areas um, from the information that I could find. 
So it goes sort of in a timeline. So remember, it was first detected in 2014 in Florida. Um, the next place that it popped up was in Jamaica in July of 2017. Um, this followed a bleaching event. So again, that could have something to do with the disease emergence. Um, next, in the Mexican Caribbean, a year later in July 2018, um, they've been doing very active intervention, monitoring, um, and assisting the response in other countries, sharing knowledge. So we've gotten some, you know, good um, advice from from people there. Um, in Saint Martin. It appeared in October 2018. Interestingly, a survey in February 2019 found higher disease rate in the non-marine protected area reefs, 60% versus 70% of highly susceptible species. So um, it seems like maybe um, reefs that are under less stress, so in protected areas, are better able to deal with the disease outbreak. Okay, the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, January 2019. So they've put in place specialized strike teams. Um, they're doing antibiotic treatments on the reef and containment intervention by actually removing some infected corals from the reef. Um, you can see a link to that story on our Facebook page. Um, Dominican Republic was detected in March 2019. Turks and Caicos Islands, spring 2019. Um, they've been doing ongoing monitoring and recently, just this year, got approval for use of antibiotic treatments on the reef. Um, Belize was detected in June 2019, so they're continuing monitoring, doing treatment applications and international cooperation. Uh, St. Eustatius was detected in August 2019, Puerto Rico, December 2019. Um, in the Bahamas, off Grand Bahama in December 2019 as well. Uh, they have an established task force surveying and have uh, put out recommendations to boats and divers um, to try to slow the spread as this could be spread through boat ballast water. Um, British Virgin Islands was detected in May of this year. They're conducting monitoring, treatment, and um, a big community outreach effort. And the Cayman Islands, just recently, June of this year, uh, they're monitoring the infected corals and right now developing a rapid response plan. So, brief intro into coral diseases. So, I am not an expert on this subject, but luckily, Danny from Utila Coral Restoration is more of an expert, and she will be giving us a detailed presentation on coral diseases um, in the coming weeks. So have a look out for that and she'll be able to give you a lot more info. Um, just some things to be aware of. So there are over 30 known coral diseases in the Caribbean. Um, stressed corals are left vulnerable to disease. Most diseases are caused by bacterial pathogens, although not a lot of the pathogens have actually been identified. Um, there's a correlation between disease occurrence and degraded environment. So poor water quality, especially from um, runoff, sewage, sedimentation. So what's called nutrient pollution in the water. Um, there's a more uh, higher instance of disease rate in corals. Some diseases also correlate with an increase in water temperature. Not all diseases cause immediate tissue loss or death. Um, some common coral diseases that we see here in Utila, um, white plague, this affects our stony corals. Um, white band, that affects only the acroporid species, dark spots disease, and yellow blotch disease. So in our second more in-depth presentation, um, I'll show you some more examples of what those diseases look like. Uh, you can see the pictures of the, the brain corals on the left, so the top one is nice and healthy, um, and the bottom one you can see the disease line. So you can see the white area of the um, exposed dead skeleton, above it still healthy coral, and below it where the algae has grown over. So that is what um, a diseased coral can look like. 
Now, a little bit about stony coral tissue loss disease and why we're concerned about it. So again, it's a new disease and it's very aggressive. Okay? It affects 20 plus reef building coral species are stony or hard corals, um, which is pretty devastating because that's a huge amount of species and these species are super important to the reef. Okay, so um, this disease is a big threat to the reef biodiversity. Imagine losing 20 species of corals all at the same time. Um, it has, it can have huge economic impacts to tourism, fisheries, and also the coastal structure because these are the important um, reef building corals. Without them, our reef loses structure and we lose that important coastal protection. Um, the cause is still undetermined. A bacterial pathogen or pathogens are suspected. Um, the disease spreads through direct contact, so coral to coral, also via ocean currents and likely through ballast water from ships. Very important, it has not yet been detected here in Utila. We need an early warning for uh, effective disease control and prevention. So that's why we have asked you guys here to help us out with looking out for this disease on the reef. Okay. So on the right, you can see a little close up of um, our mountain star coral, MCAB. Um, on the left, the brown sort of fleshy bit is the healthy uh, living coral tissue. And then on the right where you can see it's white and you can see the little ridges, that's actually the skeleton of the coral. So there's no living tissue covering it. So that's important to keep in mind when we're looking for this disease um, to be able to tell the difference between the living part of the coral and the actual dead skeleton. Okay, so how can we tell if what we're looking at is SCTLD? So really important for this disease is that it attacks species in a specific order. So the highly susceptible species will be affected first and we'll go through those species in more detail in the second presentation. But it's important to remember that we'll see it in a specific order. Um, it spreads very rapidly. Once present, the disease will spread quickly throughout a reef. Um, high mortality rate, so infected corals rapidly lose living tissue and highly susceptible colonies may die within weeks to months. Um, high prevalence, many if not all colonies of highly susceptible species on a reef will become infected. Um, multiple lesions, so tissue loss typically occurs in more than one area of the affected colony. So that's different from other diseases we might see. And the length of outbreak. So this disease outbreak lasts longer and is less affected by seasons and conditions. So some other diseases, as we said, are more prevalent in higher um, water temperatures and will subside with lower temperatures. And this disease, it doesn't seem to subside with temperature change. So what are some things that are being done to treat um, stony coral tissue loss disease? So Antibiotic treatments in field and lab tests have been successful at halting the disease spread at lesion level on most species. So an antibiotic um, mixed with a base paste is applied actually around the lesion on the coral itself. And then this can halt the spread of the disease on that lesion, okay? Um, so that has worked in both field and lab tests. So that's quite promising. They're also doing some probiotic experiments. So just like we can have, you know, probiotics, like healthy gut bacteria, they're experimenting with how to do the same thing in corals, introducing healthy bacterias, um, which might help not just a single colony, but actually many corals on the reef um, in fighting this disease. Uh, a lot of research is being done to identify the disease causing pathogen, this is very important. And continuing monitoring and data collection, restoration, rescue, and spawning programs, and knowledge sharing um, between different countries and communities. 
So what should I do if I see something suspicious? So if you are on your dive and you note a coral that looks like it could have stony coral tissue loss disease, um, if you have your camera, which would be the best thing uh, is to carry a camera on all your dives, um, take pictures of the infected area, try to get a close up and of the whole colony. Um, make a note of the exact location, GPS points if possible, the depth of the coral, the water temperature, and other conditions. Um, it's really important, do not touch any infected corals, because remember the disease spreads through direct contact. Do not dive in a separate area of reef. Disinfect all gear and remove any debris, and report the sighting to the response team Facebook group, okay? so. If you do see anything, please take those photos, make your notes and post the photos and your observations to the Facebook group. Another important thing, um, to help corals be stress-free so they're less susceptible to disease in the first place, um, do not use chemical sunscreens and try to encourage your friends and other divers uh, to not use chemical sunscreens as well, cover up, whenever you can and use only reef safe sunscreens. Use um, natural or biodegradable mask defog while diving. Very important, use your best buoyancy and teach your divers the same. Avoid stirring up the sand or sediment and keep hands, fins, cameras, gauges off the reef. Limit your chemical impact by choosing biodegradable personal care and cleaning products because as we know very well here, whatever we put down the drain ends up eventually in the ocean. Um, consider your carbon footprint. Again, um, climate change is you know, a big worry for coral reefs around the world. So whatever we can do to limit our carbon emissions is helpful for the reef. And help spread the word. Um, you know, try to educate your friends and other divers about the issues facing coral reefs and try to spread the word through your social media networks. Okay, so we need your help. Um, so become part of our network of coral observers and help us look for signs of SCTLD. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and like our Facebook page. It's called Stony Coral Disease Info Utila. Um, you'll find lots of links to resources about SCTLD. Um, we're trying to post as much info there as we can. And then join the Facebook group, um, SCTLD response team, post photos of any corals that look suspicious there, ask others in the network to watch certain dive sites um, or corals for developing disease. And through that um, group, we'll keep you informed of Utila's plan of action and share our resources and support. So together we can keep our reef healthy and happy. Woo. Thank you, Caitlin. If anybody has any questions right now for Caitlin about the disease, um, you can go ahead and ask them. If not, we'll jump right into our coral identification lecture. Okay. okay, everyone, so now we'll look at our coral. So uh, this is just a part one. Tomorrow at the same time, we'll be doing part two. So this is the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment corals. Um, so we'll be using their methodology to um so these images all belong to agra 
Okay, and this is the coral identification lecture. So we'll only be focusing on the reef building corals. So our stony corals. Um, so our stony corals are the corals that leave behind a calcareous skeleton. So if you guys know what a coral is, the coral is the entire colony of these very small animals that are called polyps. So polyps are the little animals that live within um, the, uh, the little cups called coralites. And they look like very, very, very small anemones. So they have tentacles that they spread out, mostly at night. But you'll be seeing that throughout the lecture, we'll be looking at some of the corals that have their uh, polyps uh, extended all day. And that can be used as an identifying feature. So what is the coral skeleton. We'll be looking at the shape and sizes of the polyps, but if you see in the skeleton itself, you can also tell a lot about the polyp that used to live within it. So if you see the first picture on your top left corner, you can see that those polyps were very big and they were pretty symmetrically round. Then on the picture just next to it on the right, you will see that you can't almost you can't tell exactly where the polyp mouth is because you have these long connected polyp walls. And then on the bottom left corner, you will see this uh, one that says elliptical and Y shaped. So those ones have um, like very, uh, for each polyp mouth, they have very distinct shapes. And then just on the one next to it, you will see that they have connected polyp walls. And you can, you can see where the polyp mouths would be, but they are very, very, very small. Okay. So here, if you see on the right, it says that the septa are conspicuous vertical partitions in the polyp wall. So for that, I prefer looking at this picture right here. So this one is not the skeleton anymore. This is when we actually have our polyps. As you can see, these polyps are not extended. They are contracted in, but you can see where the polyp mouth is right in the middle. You can also see what is called the septa, which we were looking at before. When it said septa, it said that it was the partition of the wall. So if you see where the mouth is, it's where the wall starts. So that is the septa. The coralite is the entire cup that holds the polyp itself. The oral disc is just where the mouth is. And then the coste is the other side of the septa. So if you have a wall, the coste would be the outside of that wall. Do we have any, any uh, problems with this vocabulary? Please let me know. I'm going to look at the chat. Let's see. No. Um, so if you guys have any problems, uh, just put on the microphone and ask the question. That is no problem at all. Um, because that is a vocabulary that we'll be seeing a lot throughout this entire presentation. Okay, so what are we looking for underwater? It does have a certain way that we see. So the first thing is going to be the most obvious one, which is colony shape. So when we are looking at a coral, some, there are some where we just look at the shape of the colony itself and we can tell exactly what it is. 
So for example, we have the elkhorn and the staghorn corals. And those ones are really, really easy to visually identify. As soon as we see it, we can be like, okay, that is an elkhorn coral. And that is, we can know that just by looking at the shape. There are other corals that we can also tell just by looking at the shape, but I think those are the most distinct ones. So if we look at the shape, then we'll look at the size. So is it a very small coral colony or is it a really, really big one? You'll see that certain corals will distinguish just by how big the colony is. We'll look at other identifying features, but sometimes your number one giveaway of what coral that's going to be is going to be the size of it. Then we'll look at the colony surface. So the colony surface is where those little coral lights are, where all of those little uh, polyps are. So you'll see whether the polyps create a bumpy uh, sur uh, surface or if it's smooth or if it's kind of like with indentations. So that's another big giveaway as to what coral we'll be looking at. If these three still haven't given you, you're still like, I am still not sure what uh, coral this is, then you start looking at the polyps themselves. So you'll look at the little coral lines and you'll see, are they small? Are they big? It's going to be another very big clue. After that, uh, we'll look at the polyp shape itself. Uh, so is it round? Is it elliptical? Like what shape is it going to be? After that, if we're still not sure what uh, colony we're looking at, we might look at color. So corals have little algae that lives within it that provides it some of its food, actually most of its food, between 80 to 90 percent depending on the colony. Um, but depending on what kind of algae that they accept, they will have different colors, which is why you'll see that certain corals uh, the color is going to be um, a very good clue as to what coral we are looking at because they only accept a very specific type of algae. Whereas with other corals, they will accept several different kinds. So the color can be very uh, highly variable. So if we're going to be looking at color to tell what coral it is, it is better if we look at some of the other things as well. And then the last one, if we, all, we looked at all of the previous ones and we're still not sure, we can also look at the septal shape. So if you remember, the septa is the little wall that borders the mouth of the coral. So we'll be looking at that as well. Uh, for that one, it's only in a couple of the corals that we actually have to look for uh, the septal shape. And I will tell you guys as we are going along with this, uh, how to look at that. So uh, I'm going to leave the link and it's also on the Facebook page to a Google Drive folder where we have all of these presentations. So in case you guys want to look at it or review them afterwards, you can definitely go ahead and do that. So during this presentation, we'll be focusing mostly on like how to identify this. So think of yourselves as underwater detectives trying to figure out what exact coral we are looking at. Now for all of this, because um, common names change quite a lot, and uh, even the even the scientific names can change. Um, as of a couple of weeks, these are all the accepted names. But in case any of those changes, uh, we'll be letting you know in the group. Um, but because we are not going to be using the common names, we'll be using what is called the Comp Coral Codes. They are very easy 
and they are easier to learn than the entire scientific name. So let's take one of my favorite corals. It's Orbicella fabulata. And what you are going to do is you're going to take the first letter of the genus name. So from Orbicella, we'll take the O, and then we'll take the first three letters of the species name. So fabulata, that would be fab. So that gives us O fab. Now, what if we can't identify the coral? We can't, like, we are looking at it. And Orbicella fabulata actually used to be in classified along with other two corals as the same species. And then back in 2012, uh, they realized that they are actually three different species in two different families. So, now, uh, those are all three separate species, uh, but they used to be thought of the same because they just look so similar. So if you can't tell which one of these three species it is, then you can just put Orbi for Orbicella, and that's also acceptable because uh, um, we just need like the general information uh, we try to be as specific as we can, but if you guys can't do that or you just don't remember it, you can also write like something that helps you remember or just the family name. Um, but as much information as you can give us, that's great. So this is the one that I was talking before, where Montestre annularis was actually reclassified as three different corals. Uh, so we'll be looking at those first. Okay. So any questions at all on the uh, vocabulary that we will be using or the coral codes so far? Okay. Um, so we'll start with our Orbicella fabulata. So our OFAM is going to have a lot of bumpy polyps, but in those, it will also have a lot of lumps throughout the entire colony. This is one of the most common corals that we get here. And so this one will be easier for us to identify if we go out snorkeling or diving. And what you'll see is that it has a lot of lumps, but all of these lumps form kind of orderly lines. So all of the lumps are very um, kind of like they're forming a queue. So if you see here, they, it can grow when it's you know, shallow or has a lot of light hitting it, it grows into this mound. Whereas if it's deeper or has a lower light hitting it, then it grows like a plate. But if you see in either of those two, you will still see the lumps and the fact that the lumps all form little, uh, almost symmetrical lines. Another thing is if you can't, like you see that a coral is bumpy, but you're not really sure, is you look at the edges of the colony. So if you see in the picture that says uh, low light conditions, you will see that the edges skirt outwards. So that's another very good identification point where the edges will flare outwards instead of holding on to the substrate. So if you see a coral and you're like, okay, I'm not really sure, just look at those edges. Our next one that got reclassified is our Orbicella annularis or our O-N. So it'll have very similar polyps, but it usually has lighter colors than the Orbicella fabulata. It grows in large colonies and you'll see that these colonies kind of form little columns like vertical columns and on these vertical columns or pillars you will see that the 
uh, lower bits are then and that all of the live polyps are at the top. This doesn't mean that this colony is deceased or that there was something wrong with it. This just means that the um, polyps at the top are growing and towards the light. So that is perfectly fi uh, fine colony. And you will see that in the different columns, um, it's still one colony. Like all of those, even though there's quite a few colonies that appear to be um, connected by dead skeleton, they're all still the same colony. Another uh, another thing that might happen is that the columns may topple and scatter um, by completely natural reasons, but that is still going to be, again, the same colony. If you, you see in this picture, you can tell that the colony is the same cor uh, the same color at the top, and that's another going to be another uh, because even in uh, different colonies close together, you might see some color variation. So that will let you know um, what part um, is each column a colony of. Um, so it it's going to be different from our OFAB because it's going to have all of these little columns that it will subdivide into, even in low light conditions. And that all of the polyps will be at the top. It will have lighter tissue colors and it will be holding on to the substrate of its own columns. So it doesn't have the skirt at the edge. And now we'll look at our last one of the three that got reclassified, and that is our Orbicella franksi, or our Ophra. So this one is more similar to our Orbicella fabulata, as it, it also has a lot of lumps. But um, this one grows quite quickly, and what you will see is that in those lumps, because it's growing in such a weird shape that some of the polyps and coralites in those will not be able to put susanthelli in its tissue. So it will have these completely natural white spots around the coral. And that will be a good indication that the coral that we are looking at is our Ophra. Um, to make sure that the polyp that we are looking at is white because of how the colony grows and not because of predation or bleaching or any other sign of disease, what you'll be looking for is the mouth of the polyp. There will always be a certain tint to the mouth of the polyp when that whiteness is due to natural just this is the way the coral grows, rather than something happened to it. So always look for the cor uh, for the color around the polyp mouth itself, as you can see in this picture. So if you're still unsure of if it's an Orbicella franksi or or Orbicella fabulata, as they grow whenever they are in high light conditions, they both grow in mounds and they will always have those lumps, is that you will be looking at the edges of the coral. So this one is going to be holding on to the substrate so it won't flare out like a skirt. It'll hold on to the substrate and it will have bigger polyps towards the edges of the colonies. So um, you will see that the edges of the colonies have bigger polyps in comparison to the ones in the middle, whereas with Orbicella fabulata, all of the polyps will be very symmetrical in shape. 
And if you see in this picture, you will see that it has those natural white spots, but it also has a lot of lumps that kind of just grow everywhere. So here it says they are the bumps are in the regular. Um, and it'll differ from Orbis alanularis because uh, Orbis alanularis grows into those distinct columns, whereas this one does not. Okay, um, so we'll be asking you guys uh, to give us some questions, some answers here. So, uh, Maka, do you want to help us out and tell us which one of this is which? You can just turn on the microphone. Or someone else if they want. It's not turning. I think you can just do control D to turn on the microphone. That's okay. Uh, let's see, Caitlin, do you really do? Do you want to tell us which one of this is which of the three one, ones that we just saw? Oh, okay. Um, so the one on the left is Oan. The one in the middle is Ofra, and the one on the right is Ofav. Yes, this is correct. So if we see all of these pictures side by side, we will be seeing that our ON is growing on those columns where it just has live polyps at the top. Then our OFRA and OFAB are growing in a singular mound, but our OFRA will have those natural white spots as you can see in the picture, and also a lot of irregular lumps. Whereas in OFAB, you will see that the lumps kind of form these lines. Um, so we'll move on to our next bits of corals. Uh, but before we do, don't worry if you cannot tell them apart um, because we just need information of like what type of coral it is. So if you can't tell them apart, don't think about it too much and just write Orbi. That is perfectly fine with us and it, again even if you can't tell them apart while you are underwater you can just take a picture send it to us and ask for our help in identification if you are doing this we do ask that you take um, a couple of pictures to take one of like the entire colony one of a uh, closer like look at the polyps and if you see any sort of disease, then you take a picture of where the disease is and send those to us. So don't worry about it too much if you can't really identify them. Now we'll be looking at our Solenastrea burnoni. So this one is our SBU. We don't really get this one here in Utila. Um, so, but we will look at how to identify them. So these ones have very, very conspicuous polyps. Uh, as you can see in the top picture, you can see that the polyps are big, so you can go by polyp size. It creates the, this mound that can be quite large, but it will always have very light colors. It, it will look almost creamy. Another good identification um, tip is going to be thinking about noni, the fruit, because the polyps also resemble the fruit. Um, 
And if you see here, it'll create some lumps, but they really will not be that big as compared to the other two. Um, and the polyps will not really stick out that much as they will in the other ones. And this one will create smaller colonies than our Orbicella franksi will. You will also see that there is quite a distinction as to where the polyps are. So they will have a big wall separating them. Okay. Um, so if we look at this one, uh, these two pictures, uh, we are going to see that the one on your left side is going to be your Orbicella franksi, and the one on your right side is going to be your Solenastrea burnoni. Um, so if you see, you can tell apart by the whiteness of the polyps on our Ophra, and the color difference between both colonies, as you can see, Esbu is a lot lighter in color, and the irregular lumps. Uh, if you would see a closer uh, picture of the polyps, you would be able to tell that the polyps on Esbu are bigger and they are not as protruded as the ones on the Ophra are going to be. Now, this is a coral I have never seen on Utila, um, but if you guys see it, please let me know because I want to see it. Uh, we'll teach you how to identify it just in case. Uh, and our Solenastrea hiatus or um, Archea, it's going to be similar to Burnoni as it will have light colors and it has very distinct walls, but in this one, the polyps will be more irregularly shaped. They will be more boxy looking than the ones in Bornoni. And it will create these lumps, but the lumps will kind of head upwards. And because the, the coral size will also be smaller when you're talking about the entire colony, it will almost look like it, this really deformed hand. Um, so you can think of the Hades uh, hand reaching up from the underworld. It's how I remember it. Um, but with size is a really good way to distinguish this one. I know in pictures, this is not going to be very easy, but it, we are not going to only be looking at pictures, we'll be out there in the water looking at these coral colonies. Next, we'll look at our Montestrea cavernosa, which is our MCAV. And this one is really, really, really easy to identify, even though it has so many different ways that it can grow in. And this is because this has really, really big round polyps that exert outwards. So they almost look like buttons. So they are very large, round, fleshy polyps. They will be around one to two centimeters in diameter, uh, sometimes even more than that. And this will also have, when you have it in highlight, it will create a mound. And when you have it in um, at depth or in low light, you will have it as a plate or as a encrusting coral, and you will see that it'll still have those excerpt polyps that kind of looks like buttons you want to press, kind of like a cave that you can go into. So that's a good way to remember the name of this one, MCAV. If you want to remember the full name, just think of monster caves because the polyp is so big. 
Another thing, uh, if you see here in Utila, is that, um, for example, at the wreck, you will see quite a lot of these colonies that are fluorescent or a bright red. And whenever, and if you try to take a picture of it with flash, that red will not show because it is caused by a fluorescent protein. Um, so it'll produce this. Uh, you'll see this in several uh, corals, but this is one of the best examples that um, MCAV does have. Another one that has really big polyps is, our go is going to be our Dicosenia stokesi or Disto. It's going to have very exert around polyps, but they will all be irregular shaped. So whereas before with our MCAB, um, all of our polyps will be around the same size. Um, these ones will all be uh, kind of different shapes. If you see at that right picture, uh, another thing that you can see is that the coral line has little teeth at the top. And whereas our MCAB comes in all sorts of different colors, including, including a fluorescent one, our distal is going to come in very basic cream or yellowish colors. Um, the one thing is that the polyps shape will always, always change in this one, even within that same colony. So if you see at this other picture at the top, you will see that some of those look like really long polyps, whereas others look very small. Some of them are very round, whereas others um, look very flattened. So it'll have a lot of variety in the uh, in the polyp shape itself within that same colony. Um, but a good way to identify it is by the kind of teeth at the top of the septum. If you, um, there is a smaller type of Dicosenia, which is a very, very small colony. And it kind of looks like a smaller, uh, like if you were to flatten out Dicosenia stokesi. So for that one, you just put this. Um, but usually these colonies tend to be so small that we don't really count them when we are doing surveys. So don't worry too much about this one. And even if you see one and you put the Cosenia stokesi, that is fine. Um, don't worry about it too much because remember, you will also have these accompanying pictures. And even if you don't, the Cosenia or the Cosenia stokesi is fine. Okay. So... Um, I will answer this one as well, because this is a little bit of a trick question. This is what we were talking about before, where um, Dicosenia stokesi can have a lot of variation. But, um, and these pictures don't quite do it justice because you can't really zoom in on them, but you will see that in all of them, you will have those very distinct septal teeth. So all of these are Dicosinia stokesi. If you see, some of them have very exert polyps, like you can see on the second one from the right. Some of them have these long lines uh, on each polyp like you can see on the first picture from the right and others look less so as you can see in the two left pictures but these are all the same colony another thing that you can tell here is that they're all kind of in that yellow um, color whereas our mcap can be all sorts of different colors
this is this coral its common name is our golf ball coral because it grows to such a small small size so if you see it kind of looks like a baby dicosenia stokesi or disto um and it will also have those teeth at the top but your number one indicator that it's going to be this coral it's going to be the size of it if you're trying to determine where it's, it's a Fabia fragrum or a Dicosenia stoxi that just is a small colony. Then what you can do is get really nice and close to it and look at how exert those polyps are because um, a Fabia fragrum will not have will not stick out as much as the ones from Dicosenia stoxi will. Um, but your number one indicator is going to be size, as these ones grow very, very small. Okay, so on this one, which is going to be which, let's see if uh, Brooklyn, do you want to give us a hand? Um, you can use Control D to take the mute of the mic. So, uh, this is no longer a trick question. Um, this one, your first one is going to be the Cosenia, and your second one, your middle one, is going to be our MCAV. And then the last one, uh, they're kind of trying to give you a sense of size with this picture. So, it's trying to tell you look at how much smaller this one is than the other two. So it's going to be our Fabia fragrum. Again, in pictures, it's really hard to tell because you don't really have any of those indicators that we were talking about before, like what the overall coral colony is going to look like, what the coral colony shape and size, and is it growing on a mound? Is it growing? Um, so it's going to be a lot harder. So don't worry about it too much if you think right now, like, oh, I really can't identify all of these different corals. Because again, in the water, when you're looking at them, it's going to be a lot easier. And um, you will be able to look at a lot of different uh, clues, which will tell you what coral you are going to be looking at. So don't worry about it if you think that right now it's too much. And again, you will have all of these resources available to you guys. Um, and uh, any of us are always here and around to help. So you can just send us messages just being like, hey, I saw this coral that I couldn't identify. And you can send us information about it. Yeah. Now our next coral is going to be a sin or Cerastrea siderea. And this one is really, really easy to identify and it's really, really, really common around here. So a sin is going to have any polyps. So it's going to look like if you took a big ball of clay and you started poking it with a pencil because all of those polyp mouths are going to be sunken. Um, it says here that it's usually in a uniform color, gray, yellow to brown. But here in Utah, there's always something happening with uh, SN. Uh, whenever it stresses, it doesn't stress into a lighter color. It stresses into this bluish or purplish shade. So you will see a lot of like blue purple corals and it's going to be SN. Um, don't worry too much if you see that there's a lot of them in that bluish purplish shape because they, they, they tend to be a little bit of a drama queen of a coral. So they always have something happening to it. As you can see in these pictures, this is what the, the, those colors are going to be. So um, don't worry if you're like, there's something happening with all of the acids around Utila. They're always kind of that color. 
Now there's another coral that looks very similar to a sin, but instead of having um, where the polyp mouth is be completely in, as uh, in uh, Arcerastrea sidrea, our S rad is actually going to have kind of just pinched little corals. So instead of having like a full kind of almost whole, it's going to have just little pinched polyps. So it create, uh, it will also be a lot smaller. Um, so whereas as Sid grows into these big mounds, uh, our S rad is only going to grow about 30 centimeters had its at most, and it's always going to be kind of encrusting over things. It will also usually be a lighter color. So you might think of it as an S thin, that something has happened to it and it's bleached or stressed, but it's just a lighter color overall. It's going to be kind of a cream color, whereas the other one um, can have darker colors. So in this picture, which is re a really, really nice close-up, you can see um, our S Sid on the left and our S Rad on the right. And you will see that the S Sid has those sunken holes where the polyp mouth is, whereas our S Rad, it's going to look more pinched. So it doesn't like fully go in, uh, it just looks like you pinched where the mouth is. Do we have any questions so far? You guys can ask them in the chat as well. And I will like check on it. Okay. So on this one, we have our, the opposite. We have our SRAD on the left and our SID on the right. Uh, so this colony of SRAD, it's about as big as it gets. Uh, whereas our SID, we can have these really, really beautiful big boulders of it. And especially in the shallower areas, you will see quite a lot of these. And we are going to be looking at our Stephanoquenia intercepta, or our SINT, which sounds like mouthful. Um, so just uh, remember scent, it's quite easy. And its common name is going to be the blushing coral because it will usually have its tentacles out, but they have really, really, really small tentacles. So whenever something disturbs it, um, it will bring those tentacles in and it'll kind of change the color around it because it'll contract entirely and it'll kind of like if you see in the lower picture it'll go from like looking very colorful to looking almost white because they will blush when the polyps contract this one is very common around here in utila and what you will do to a identify it from all of the ones that we were looking at is that it really doesn't have like very obviously exert or sunken polyps. They do sink a little bit, but if you look at the polyps in a more close up way, it almost looks as if they were stamped on because it doesn't really look uh, sunken, like the ones we were looking at before, our S rad and our S sid. So it just looks like somebody put the little cookie cutter shape into the coral um, and left everything as is. Um, how you will, um, how you will tell this coral apart from let's say a Solenastrea burnoni is that it will have a lot smaller polyps and it's not going to create like those bumpy surfaces of the coral 
and it will also have very regular shapes um where and our Solena Strabornoni also has um polyps that exert outwards um but another way is that if you see a coral here it's most likely going to be synth instead of esbu Another way to tell apart synth and s rad is where it grows. So our synth prefers to grow um, on the crust of the reef or low um, or deeper, let's say between about 5 to 15, 20 meters, whereas s rad really prefers growing in those uh, first five meters of reef, so it likes to find the light. Uh, and it's also going to be by size because our Stephanoquinia intercepta is going to create really big uh, colonies, whereas our Ezra is going to create a lot smaller colonies. Uh, so in this one, uh, you can see that we have our synth, on your left, we have on our right, we are going to have our esbu, and right there at the top in the middle, you are going to have our srad. And uh, again, pictures really don't tell you that much about the colony because you can't really, let's say, look in and look at the polyps. Um, but you can tell this by the colony shape and size, whereas your esbu has those irregular lumps. Our esrad is quite small, and the picture is also trying to give you that fact that it's quite small compared to these other two colonies. And your scent um, is going to be very smooth, and you will see no obvious exertion or sunken polyps. Our Puelites asteroides, I think, is our last coral that we are going to be looking at today. And one thing about our past coral is that it will have a lot of different, uh, it can grow in a lot of different shapes. It can grow in mounds, it can grow in plates, it can grow in crusting, it can grow in a lot of different ways. And it will also grow in a lot of different colors, even in the same col colony. So if you see at the bottom left picture, you will see two different distinct colors in the same colony. So it can grow in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but a good way to be to tell where our past is going to be um, is that it will almost always have the polyps extended out so all of the little tentacles from the polyps will be um, just out and it will make it look like the coral is very fuzzy so it looks like a very fuzzy corals. Um, another thing is that it creates these very, very small lumps. Again, I know that these pictures don't quite show you size, but if you see at this top right picture, you will see um, the algae growing around it, it, and that is a very small algae, about two to three centimeters total so you will see that those are very small lumps so when we were talking about the other corals before that are lumpy this one is going to have a lot of small bumps but again uh, out in the water what you'll be looking at is that fuzzy look so you might have to kind of uh, co uh, get closer to the coral to get a better look and you'll see all of the fuzz about this coral. Okay, so that is our last coral of today. If you guys have any questions, you can ask them right now. How do I stop presenting? There we go. 
so yes if you guys have any questions you can ask them right now um if not we will have the part two tomorrow you can also if you're like later on looking at these corals um in the group on facebook there is a link to um a google drive and it's going to have not just these presentations but it'll also have other helpful things um it has uh, in the training, you will see some flashcards that you can download and it shows you pictures of the coral and then if you click on it again, it'll give you the name of the coral. So you can use that to kind of refresh. But again, the number one thing is to just go out and look at the corals. Um, so for whoever's not here, I know Maka, you're uh, not here right now you're quarantining uh, you can also look at past pictures you can look online you can use those flashcards, and they're going to be really helpful there's also other links there um, and obviously the internet is a great vast space so there's coralpedias um, that you can look at as well but they kind of tend to have corals from all over the world uh, whereas we are kind of uh, just doing um, the um, corals from the Caribbean and specifically targeting to the ones that we see here in Utila and the Bay Islands. Uh, so thank you so much, guys. And I will see you tomorrow.